Hi, everyone, and thank you for your time during what is certainly a very extraordinary moment on so many levels, but uh, one that is specifically creating what I believe is a once in a generation unlock moment that rarely occurs, especially in industries as rigid and as ossified as healthcare. And if you were to rewind the clock to, you know, seven, eight months ago, pre-pandemic, um, we had already at that time been talking about these tectonic shifts that were just creating unprecedented opportunities for company creation across the entire care delivery space, whether it was the unbundling of the hospital and the notion of uh, sort of the deconstruction of the set of services that were available in these monolithic hospitals to make care far more accessible and convenient and affordable for consumers like us, whether it was the transition to value-based care whether it was the notion of distributing products direct to consumer, something that had historically been an, an anathema to uh, in, in the healthcare space, but was starting to see uh, sort of early signs of life. One that's near and dear to my heart was the notion of recontouring of provider networks and you know sort of fundamentally redefining what it means to be a provider to begin with, and also how you could tap into networks uh, that were far broader than the ones that had historically been defined by traditional health plans. And then certainly interoperability and automation, there had been much talk about this for you know many, many years, um, and we were just starting to see the sprouting of the wings around efforts like that. Now, all of those things were tailwinds that we thought would take 10 years or, or even longer to play out. But with the current dynamics at play during this pandemic, um, it's more likely that those, those things will play out in two or three years. And therefore, we're, we're just seeing the topology of healthcare fundamentally changing before our eyes. And, you know, that's just going to really impact how data flows, how it gets utilized, how operations work, et cetera, and really just um, sort of overturn much of what has been the, the way of doing business to date. And all of this is, is sort of a consequence of the fact that we're just seeing fundamental dislocation on both sides of the market. And that just rarely happens, you know, again, in any industry, but certainly in the healthcare market. On the supply side, we're seeing uh, legacy providers, you know, having to to really shrink their services mix down to these essential services. And, you know, it's no different than many other services industries. You see restaurants, for instance, uh, shrinking their menus to streamline their supply chain and operations as well. And in hospitals and provider groups are no different. Um, and what that does is it creates vulnerability around the edges. It leaves ancillary services up for grabs and therefore, you know, new c competitive dynamics um, sort of nipping at, at what used to be a core part of the services mix for those traditional providers. Uh, and then relatedly, you know, competition is not just coming from local markets anymore, but all of a sudden capacity and supply from all over the country is in play at all hours of the day and through all different channels. And so, you know, suppliers are, are just having to, you know, finally rethink how they think about competition. And, you know, I think very starkly, this is the first recession in which the healthcare labor growth has actually been reversed. Um, it's, it's typically been the case that in past recessions, healthcare was the only industry that grew its labor force uh, during those times, but this, this has been the reverse. Um, and then on the demand side, on the consumer side, you obviously have the unfortunate you know, mass unemployment uh, that has le led to just massive shifts in insurance coverage and what that landscape looks like. Affordability will become even more prominent of a focus. And as a result, I believe that consumers will be willing to sever long-standing provider relationships in the name of affordability and access. At the same time as all of this occurring, we are also seeing uh, the rewiring of the value chains that have existed in the healthcare space to date. You know, what used to be uh, multiple silos of companies, each owning a different aspect of the patient journey is now changing. The unfortunate reality of that landscape was that handoffs were not well instrumented. Patients, you know, fell through the cracks and providers had very little context when patients were referred to them. And, you know, that's a lot of what drove the rising costs of healthcare delivery, you know, because of these sort of redundant processes that needed to be implemented to facilitate those transitions between these various steps in the patient journey. So what we see now is a new generation of digital health providers, digital first providers that are saying, you know what, we're going to flip that paradigm on its head and we're going to actually own the end-to-end -end patient journey. We're going to take what historically has been fragmented and put it all into a one-stop shop. And the actual compromise that we'll make to be able to do that well is that we're going to uh, sort of focus on specific patient populations and be the best-in-class provider for those specific patient segments. And we're seeing that happen in primary care, in chronic disease management, around specific demographics of patients, whether it's seniors, whether it's women, whether it's other specific demographics. And so the shape and the form with which 
new providers are, are going to take shape in the future will be just be fundamentally different, I believe, than what it has been in the past. Now, one of the risks as care becomes more unbundled like that is that data becomes more fragmented. But um, the data that are being generated by these novel care providers, you know, outside of the traditional EHRs and the traditional providers is far more high resolution, far more granular. And very soon, I think we're going to be at a tipping point where it's far more valuable than the data generated by the traditional players. And especially during COVID with remote patient monitoring, contact tracing, home-based lab tests all taking off, there's just these new pools of data that are um, just going to be um, tremendously valuable for generating the types of insights that are hard to get from the traditional data stores. And, you know, what's happening with uh, some of these virtual clinics and these virtual care providers that are popping up is that they're able to pull data in from some of the traditional care providers um, through what's been laid down via traditional efforts around interoperability. But generally speaking, the data does not flow back. You know, so if I'm a standalone virtual care provider, yes, I'm able to tap into your traditional and historical medical records, but I'm not necessarily able to flow my data back, the data that I'm generating through more continuous engagement with you as a patient. And that's really a missed opportunity. And so, you know, the center of gravity of data and interoperability efforts needs to shift from, you know, just focusing on the incumbents and just focusing on the traditional EHRs to really focusing on the next generation of care delivery providers. Now, all of what I just described should be sufficient to convince us that there is just explosive opportunity in this whole space. But those of us who have been in healthcare for a long time know that it's often, uh, for better or for worse, only with the institution of a top-down regulatory mandate that sea change actually happens. And if you look back, regulation oftentimes is the scapegoat as a barrier to innovation. But I think we should be looking at it the other way, that regulation can actually be a catalyst for some of the major platforms that have been created in the past several decades. And the iconic companies that have arose within those categories are also the ones that have been sort of the industry defining players um, historically as well. And we certainly see those dynamics playing out today with whether it's remote care and, and the new reimbursement codes that are enabling wider spread adoption of those paradigms, whether it's transparency and the notion of price transparency, uh, removal of, of um, surprise billing, things of that sort, and uh, interoperability obviously as being a major category that is relevant to this as well. So in this perfect storm moment, there are just innumerable opportunities for startups to really play a main stage role in creating and operating the care delivery system of the future. So what do some of those zones of opportunity look like? Now, before we go into specific concepts, let's step back for a second and remind ourselves of what the ultimate goal is. Why are we doing this? And it's really to get at this holy grail equation of how do we build a cheaper, more cost-effective care delivery system without sacrificing quality. And, you know, I think we think here at A16Z that this is all predicated on a movement of a mindset of intuition to one of engineering, that you actually need to really fundamentally think about reasonable components and codification of learnings in such a way that leads to 10x efficiency and scale. And that also is, you know, one of the reasons why it's such a unique and interesting and exciting moment right now is that we finally are seeing the opportunity to wedge technology into the zones that historically have been very human led to enable this paradigm shift across the industry. So the first major opportunity that we see is this concept of the new operating system for care delivery. And you look at the landscape right now, there are you know, over a thousand digital health companies that have, have popped up and are now directly serving millions of patients. And every single digital health company is either building its own core infrastructure from scratch or taking a system off the shelf and just customizing the heck out of it to get it to do what it needs it to do. And, you know, none of those legacy systems, which by the way, for the most part were developed 10 or 20 plus years ago, are optimized to really serve the modern use case as well. None of them treat patients as the main end user. All of them are, are premised on, on a fee-for-service chassis, um, and they were all certainly built before the current interoperability standards really existed. So now we're in this moment where there is enough demand from these modern digital healthcare delivery providers to support a dedicated set of companies that are building the new infrastructure tools that should become the native fabric of every digital health company that gets built going forward, that will have automation built in, that will have interoperability built in, that will support even basic things like budgeting and accounting type practices and, and capabilities to ensure that these organizations can actually take on risk. 
Related to that, there's the data element. So today's paradigm is that we make every doctor learn from scratch every time they meet with a new patient. And the majority of the cycles between you know, the time that I book an appointment with my doctor um, to the time when I leave that visit, so much of that time is spent on data collection about me. So I get a phone call or a, a text link to collect my demographic information, my contact information, my insurance information, my past medical history. There's phone calls, there's faxes, there's paper being sent back and forth. Why do we spin the wheel every time? Why can't we move to a system that actually maintains a living, breathing view of my patient narrative such that we can enable doctors to move away from the work surrounding data collection and actually focus on creating a care plan and and that's personalized to me? And it goes far beyond just care delivery. The convergence between care delivery and life sciences is another major tailwind that um, I'm extremely excited about. And especially as treatments become more complex and expensive, Payers and providers are seeking to move, you know, from this sort of pay-per-dose paradigm to a pay-for-outcomes paradigm, and that can really only be accomplished with the ability to collect and analyze longitudinal, holistic, robust data at the patient level, and then deploying the resulting insights in real time at the point of care. Again, illustrating the need for this patient lookup type system. You know, there have been many, many interoperability solutions. So you might be saying, well, why haven't the existing solutions solved this so far? Well, I think we have to go far beyond just data transmission alone, which is what many of those systems are focused on. There's a whole set of layers on top of that having to do with identity management and whole person identity management. So not just the clinical data, but really everything else about me and all the non-clinical aspects that inform my health state. There has to be a an ability to do really fine-grained security and privacy and authorization of who gets access to what components of my record for what purpose and transparency into who all of those accessors are. Um, you know, autom- use, use of AI and ML in a truly uh, comprehensive fashion for automated si- signal detection from that data and then true network orientation around how apps can then be built on top of that data. Which leads us to the Third area that I'll I'll talk about is, you know, this notion of supply demand matching at national scale. So with all of the talk of telehealth these days, I think it's missing the point if we're just focused on the notion of a video visit as the fundamental driver of value in this new world. It's really the fact that all of a sudden we're in a world where for most healthcare needs, you're really no longer constrained by your geography and you can actually tap into the nationwide spot market of supply whether it's physicians, whether it's nurses, whether it's other insulin care providers. And, you know, that that necessitates fundamentally new competencies and how we think about intelligently routing a patient to the right care at the right time, at the right place, and also load balancing across these virtual networks. And how do you sort of take spare capacity that might be sitting seven states away on a different time zone, but make that available to people who might need it for the specific expertise and specific purpose of that provider existing. And so that data layer, that intelligence layer around routing and load balancing is one part of this. Um, I think perhaps what is more exciting and more lucrative is the opportunity to really build new insurance products on top of that infrastructure uh, where you have fundamentally new network design, again, not constrained to local geographies, but really able to tap into national virtual networks of capacity and therefore be able to price far more dynamically, again, in this day and age where people are going to be seeking out more affordable care options the notion of pricing and transparent pricing and direct pricing will play a much more substantive role in how these insurance products are designed. And that requires a very high resolution, accurate and actionable data in real time about what options are available on the network side of things. So all this to say that it's really, it's time to build. And, you know, we are truly in this great unlock moment that hardly ever comes along in life and and specifically in the healthcare industry. Having been in this market for about 15 years, there are definitely things that I would have considered fundamentally intractable problems, not fundamentally intractable because of technology per se, but really because of the structure of the industry and, and what incentives existed in the industry. And so many of those things have just been upturned that create these unique and unprecedented opportunities. And I, I couldn't be more excited for the companies that are getting formed and, and scaled now in that I truly believe that the next 10 years are going to be incredible for those of us who are seeking to both transform the way that the legacy healthcare system works, but also build and scale the new healthcare system outside of that, but in a way that is connected with the rest of the healthcare value chain.